Welcome to the Saving Castles podcast, the sanctuary for castle devotees and medieval history enthusiasts. Prepare to embark on a thrilling voyage through time as we unveil enthralling history and legend. From ancient folklore to cutting-edge restoration, we've got it all covered. So grab your headphones and let's dive right in. In the annals of history, few figures captivate the imagination like Napoleon Bonaparte. A man whose life was a tapestry of paradoxes, he was both a visionary and a despot, a romantic and a tactician, a liberator and an oppressor. Today, we embark on an odyssey to uncover the hidden layers of this enigmatic leader, a journey that will traverse the corridors of power, the battlefields of Europe, and the intimate chambers of his tumultuous love life. This is a tale not just of a man, but of an era that redefined the contours of power and passion. Born on the rugged island of Corsica in 1769, just as the old order of Europe was on the cusp of dramatic change, Napoleon's story is one of meteoric rise, from obscurity to immortal fame. His early years were marked by the struggle for Corsican independence, a crucible that forged in him a fierce sense of ambition and a relentless drive. As a young boy, he was sent to France for education, where he quickly distinguished himself with his intellect and military acumen. These were the formative years that shaped the strategist who would later sun the world with his military campaigns. But Napoleon was not just a military genius. He was a man of profound contradictions. He loved with a passion that was as fiery as his battles, yet he was often cold and calculating in his personal relationships. His marriage to Josephine de Beauharnais, a widow six years his senior, was a union of love, ambition, and convenience. Their relationship, fraught with infidelities and political manoeuvrings, was as dramatic as the battles he fought. It was a love that would define him, betray him, and ultimately shape his destiny. In this episode, we will delve deep into the shadows of Napoleon's life, exploring the man behind the myth. We will uncover how he used propaganda and misinformation to craft an image of invincibility, turning his setbacks into legends of heroism. His control over the press was unprecedented, creating a narrative that elevated him to almost god-like status among his followers. Yet beneath this veneer of unassailable power lay a man riddled with insecurities and driven by an insatiable thirst for glory. Our journey will take us to the sands of Egypt, where Napoleon embarked on an ambitious campaign that was as much about scientific discovery as it was about military conquest. The Egyptian expedition, a curious blend of enlightenment and imperialism, was a testament to Napoleon's grand vision for himself and for France. It was here, among the ancient pyramids and the mysterious Sphinx, that Napoleon's legend would begin to crystallize, a legend that would capture the imagination of the world. As we navigate through the labyrinth of Napoleon's life, we would encounter a man who was a master at the art of seduction. His romantic escapades were numerous, each a chapter in the complex narrative of his life. These affairs were not mere dalliances. They were intertwined with his political ambitions, each woman a piece in the intricate puzzle of his quest for power. Napoleon's rise to power was nothing short of extraordinary. From a general in the army to the Emperor of France, his ascent was fueled by a combination of military brilliance, political savvy, and an unyielding will to dominate. His reforms and centralization of power transformed France, leaving an indelible mark on the nation and on Europe. But with great power came great responsibility, and for Napoleon, a relentless pursuit to establish a dynasty that would cement his legacy. The Continental System, Napoleon's grand strategy to cripple Britain economically, was a bold move that would have far-reaching consequences. It was an audacious attempt to challenge the supremacy of the British Empire, a battle not of swords and muskets, but of embargoes and trade. This economic warfare was a reflection of Napoleon's understanding of the complexities of power, 
an understanding that power was not just won on the battlefield, but in the markets and the minds of people. Our expedition through Napoleon's life will inevitably lead us to the Russian campaign of 1812, a gamble that would prove to be his undoing. The invasion of Russia was a testament to Napoleon's overreach, a miscalculation driven by hubris that would lead to a catastrophic retreat from Moscow. It was a turning point that marked the beginning of the end of his empire. As we reach the conclusion of our journey, we will witness the downfall and exile of a man who once held Europe in his grasp, from his exile in Elba to his dramatic return to power and final defeat at Waterloo, Napoleon's story is a roller coaster of triumph and tragedy. His subsequent exile to St. Helena was the last chapter in the life of a man who had dreamed of an empire but found himself confined to a remote island in the Atlantic. We will explore the many facets of Napoleon Bonaparte, peeling back the layers of myth to reveal the man underneath. We will journey through the highs and lows of his life, examining how his personal relationships, his political maneuvers, and his military campaigns shaped not just his destiny, but the course of history. In the heart of the Mediterranean, on the rugged, windswept island of Corsica, the saga of Napoleon Bonaparte begins. Born on August 15, 1769, in Ajaccio, to Carlo Bonaparte and Letizia Ramolino, Napoleon's journey from a Corsican outsider to the Emperor of France is a tale of ambition, identity, and the relentless pursuit of greatness. Let us delve into the early years of Napoleon, unearthing the roots that shaped the destiny of one of history's most enigmatic figures. Corsica, a land of harsh landscapes and fierce independence, had only recently become a part of France when Napoleon was born. The island, with its centuries, old traditions, and strong sense of identity, was a world apart from the opulence and sophistication of mainland France. The Bonapartes were of minor nobility, more Italian than French, in a land that was struggling with its newfound French identity. This duality of belonging and alienation would be a recurring theme in Napoleon's life. Napoleon's father, Carlo, a lawyer, was embroiled in the Corsican resistance against French rule, but later aligned himself with the French to secure a future for his son. This pragmatic, albeit controversial, decision by his father would open doors for young Napoleon, providing him with opportunities beyond the rugged shores of his homeland. Yet the spirit of Corsican nationalism, with its ideals of liberty and defiance, was deeply ingrained in him. These early experiences of political turmoil and cultural duality would profoundly influence his worldview. From a tender age... Napoleon exhibited traits that would come to define his character, ambition, intelligence, and a sense of destiny. Sent to the mainland at the age of nine to receive a formal education, he entered the military school. Here, isolated and linguistically different, he faced mockery and isolation, experiences that fueled both his resilience and an enduring sense of otherness. In these formative years, the seeds of his future military prowess and strategic acumen were sown. Despite these challenges, Napoleon excelled academically, particularly in mathematics and history. He devoured texts on military strategy and history, drawing inspiration from the lives of past conquerors and rulers. These studies were not mere academic pursuits. They were the blueprints for his future ambitions. Napoleon's voracious reading shaped his strategic thinking, laying the groundwork for the military innovations he would later introduce. The French Revolution, which erupted when Napoleon was a young man, presented both a crisis and an opportunity. The revolution, with its ideals of liberty, equality, and fraternity, resonated with the young Corsican, who saw in it a chance to rise above his provincial origins. The chaos of the revolution dismantled the old social order, creating a vacuum that ambitious individuals like Napoleon could exploit. He aligned himself with the revolutionaries, seizing the moment to ascend the ranks of the military. Napoleon's early military assignments were marked by his boldness and ingenuity. His first command, the artillery at the siege of Toulon, showcased his remarkable strategy.
strategic mind. He turned the tide of the battle with his innovative placement of artillery, earning him recognition and a rapid promotion. This early success was a harbinger of the military genius that would later dominate the battlefields of Europe. In Corsica, the Bonaparte family's shifting allegiances during the political upheaval led to their eventual exile. This dislocation was a pivotal moment for Napoleon. It severed his last ties to his homeland, freeing him from the constraints of his provincial identity. He was no longer just a Corsican. He was now a Frenchman, with all the opportunities and challenges that this new identity entailed. It is clear that Napoleon's Corsican roots were both a cradle and a crucible. The island shaped his character, instilled in him a deep sense of ambition, and provided the initial stage upon which his remarkable abilities were first displayed. Yet it was also a place of limitation, a reminder of his outsider status, which he strove to overcome throughout his life. From the rugged mountains of Corsica to the grandeur of Paris, Napoleon's journey was not just a tale of personal ambition, but a reflection of the tumultuous times in which he lived. His story is a testament to the power of ambition and the relentless pursuit of greatness, rooted in the soil of his Corsican homeland. In the tapestry of Napoleon Bonaparte's life, few threads are as vibrant and intricate as his relationship with Josephine de Beauharnais. Their union, born in the crucible of the French Revolution, was a complex interplay of love, ambition, and political convenience. We will unveil the enigmatic bond between Napoleon and Josephine, exploring how their passionate, tumultuous, and ultimately tragic relationship influenced the course of history. Josephine, born Marie-Joseph Rose Tasha de la Pagrie in Martinique, was a woman of exquisite beauty and sophisticated charm. She arrived in France at a young age, entering into an arranged marriage with Alexandre de Beauharnais, a union that thrust her into the upper echelons of French society. However, the wings of revolution brought turmoil to her life. Alexandre was guillotined during the Reign of Terror, leaving Josephine a widow with two children. Her survival during these tumultuous times was a testament to her resilience and cunning traits that would later endear her to Napoleon. Napoleon, then a rising star in the French military, was smitten by Josephine's allure when they first met in Paris. Despite their six-year age difference and Josephine's status as a widow with children, Napoleon was captivated. Their courtship was a whirlwind marked by passionate letters in which Napoleon laid bare his intense affection and longing. In 1796, they were married in a civil ceremony, a union that marked the confluence of love and ambition. The early years of their marriage were shadowed by the demands of war. Napoleon, deeply in love with Josephine, was often away on campaigns his letters revealing a man torn between his duties as a general and his yearning for his wife. These letters, filled with expressions of love and bouts of jealousy, offer a glimpse into the depth of Napoleon's affection for Josephine. They also reveal a man grappling with the vulnerabilities of love, a stark contrast to his image as a formidable military leader. Josephine, for her part, was a complex character— she was not merely the object of Napoleon's affection, but a shrewd and astute woman who navigated the treacherous waters of post-revolutionary France with grace and tact. Her social acumen and connections were invaluable to Napoleon, helping him consolidate his power and status in French society. However, their marriage was not without its challenges. Josephine's inability to bear Napoleon a child and her rumoured infidelities became sources of tension and heartache. The narrative of their relationship is punctuated by moments of both profound intimacy and painful estrangement. Napoleon's rise to power as the Emperor of France in 1804 transformed their union into a partnership of imperial ambition. Josephine was crowned Empress, a role she embraced with elegance and duty. However, the question of an heir loomed large, casting a shadow over their relationship. In 1810, the tides of destiny turned. Napoleon, consumed by the need for an heir to secure his dynasty, made the heart-wrenching decision to divorce Josephine. 
The separation was a poignant testament to the conflict between personal love and political necessity. Napoleon's marriage to Marie-Louise of Austria, while politically astute, lacked the passion and depth of his union with Josephine. Josephine retreated to Chateau de Malmaison, her residence outside Paris, where she cultivated a life of elegance and patronage of the arts. Her relationship with Napoleon transformed into one of affectionate correspondence, a bond that endured despite their separation. In death, as in life, Josephine left an indelible mark on Napoleon's heart. When Napoleon died in exile on the remote island of St. Helena, among his final words were, France, the army, the head of the army, Josephine. These words encapsulate the profound connection and enduring love he held for Josephine, a love that transcended the trials of their marriage and the vicissitudes of power. The story of Napoleon and Josephine remains a fascinating chapter in the annals of history. Their relationship was a confluence of passion, power, and tragedy, a narrative that reflects the complexities of love and ambition in times of great upheaval. Their legacy is not just one of imperial conquest and political manoeuvring, but also a testament to the enduring power of human emotions in shaping the course of history. In the grand theatre of history, Napoleon Bonaparte was not just a brilliant military tactician, but also a masterful manipulator of public perception. Napoleon's use of propaganda, misinformation, and his mastery in crafting an immortal image of himself were pivotal in his ascent to power and maintaining his legendary status. At the heart of Napoleon's strategy was his profound understanding of the power of narrative. In an age when the dissemination of information was becoming increasingly pivotal, he harnessed the burgeoning power of the media to craft a public persona that oscillated between a romantic hero and an infallible leader. His control over the press was unprecedented in its scope and effectiveness, turning newspapers into instruments of his will, shaping public opinion to his advantage. Napoleon's propaganda machine was a complex web of censorship, patronage, and persuasion. He understood that in order to maintain his grip on power, he needed to control not only the armies he commanded, but also the narrative that surrounded him. He employed a cadre of skilled journalists, artists, and writers who were tasked with glorifying his achievements and whitewashing his failures. The newspapers under his influence churned out stories that elevated his military campaigns to the status of legendary exploits, portraying him as a liberator and a visionary. The creation of the Napoleonic myth was not limited to the written word. Art played a crucial role in this narrative construction. Napoleon commissioned paintings and sculptures that depicted him as a larger-than-life figure, a hero of mythical proportion. These works of art were carefully crafted to convey a sense of awe and grandeur, immortalizing his victories and leadership. The iconic painting of Napoleon crossing the Alps is a testament to this, where the reality of a difficult mountain passage is transformed into a symbolic ascent of a leader conquering the insurmountable. Napoleon's manipulation of information extended beyond the glorification of his successes. He was adept at spinning his failures into narratives of heroism or blame shifting onto others. The disastrous Egyptian campaign, where his army faced immense hardships and eventual defeat, was repackaged as a scientific and cultural mission, overshadowing the military blunders. The narrative was carefully controlled to maintain the illusion of success, preserving his image as an unbeatable strategist. This mastery of deception also played a crucial role in his political manoeuvrings. Napoleon's rise to power was marked by a series of coups and strategic alliances, each step carefully orchestrated and presented to the public as necessary for the stability and greatness of France. The coup of 18, Brumaire, which ultimately led to him becoming the ruler of France, was a master class in political deception, cloaked in the guise of saving the Republic from chaos. 
Napoleon's propaganda was not merely a tool for domestic consumption. He was acutely aware of its impact on the international stage. His portrayal as a stabilizing force and a champion of the French Revolution's ideals was intended to influence foreign governments and populations. It was a bid to legitimize his rule and to position France as a dominant power in Europe under his unassailable leadership. However, this manipulation of truth had its consequences. The reliance on propaganda and censorship created a disconnect between the reality of his rule and the public perception. As his empire expanded and the toll of continuous wars weighed heavily on France, the cracks in the Napoleonic myth began to show. The very mechanism that helped him rise to power eventually contributed to his downfall, as the truth of the hardships and failures could no longer be masked by grand narratives. Napoleon's legacy as a master of deception is as significant as his military conquests. He was a pioneer in understanding the influence of media and narrative in shaping public opinion and political power. His manipulation of information was a double-edged sword elevating him to legendary status, but also sowing the seeds of his eventual downfall. The story of Napoleon, the master of deception, is a fascinating exploration of the power of narrative in history and a cautionary tale of the perils of manipulating truth. In 1798, Napoleon Bonaparte embarked on one of the most audacious and grandiose adventures of his career, the Egyptian Campaign. This venture, a blend of military ambition, scientific exploration, and personal aggrandizement, would forever change the course of history. Let us examine the drama, intrigue, and ambition of Napoleon's Egyptian odyssey, revealing the layers of this complex expedition that was as much about cultural conquest as it was about military dominance. The Egyptian campaign was born from a melange of strategic and personal motives. Napoleon, ever the strategist, saw Egypt as a key to undermining British influence in the Mediterranean and disrupting their trade routes to India. It was also a chance to expand French influence in the Orient, a region shrouded in mystery and allure. For Napoleon, however, the campaign was more than just military strategy. It was an opportunity to etch his name alongside the great conquerors of history and to satisfy his insatiable thirst for glory. Napoleon's fleet set sail with an army of over 35,000 men, but this was no ordinary military expedition. Accompanying the soldiers were over 150 scientists, engineers and artists, it was a commission of the sciences and arts. This eclectic group was tasked with studying and documenting the ancient civilization of Egypt, a mission that underscored the campaign's unique blend of military conquest and intellectual inquiry. The drama of the Egyptian campaign unfolded with the intensity of an epic. The Battle of the Pyramids, where Napoleon's forces triumphed over the Mamluks, was a showcase of his military genius. The French used their superior firepower and tactical acumen to devastating effect, decimating the Mamluk cavalry with their disciplined infantry squares. This victory was not just a military triumph. It was a statement of the arrival of a new force in the ancient lands of Egypt. However, the campaign was marred by challenges and unforeseen difficulties. The French fleet, anchored at Abugir Bay, was decimated by the British Royal Navy under Admiral Horatio Nelson in the Battle of the Nile. This catastrophic loss cut off Napoleon's army from France, turning the campaign into a struggle for survival. The isolation of his forces in a hostile land was the first in a series of miscalculations that would eventually cloud the campaign. Despite these setbacks, the scientific and cultural achievements of the campaign were groundbreaking. The discovery of the Rosetta Stone, a steel inscribed with ancient scripts, was a milestone that would later unlock the secrets of Egyptian hieroglyphs. The scholars documented Egypt's ancient architecture, flora, fauna, and customs, producing the monumental description De Egypti, a comprehensive compilation of knowledge on Egyptian history and culture.
Napoleon's interactions with the Egyptian people were complex and multifaceted. He attempted to portray himself as a liberator and a friend of Islam, even adopting Egyptian customs and dress to win the hearts and minds of the locals. However, the realities of military occupation, cultural misunderstandings, and the resistance from local leaders, including the formidable Ottoman governor of Egypt, complicated these efforts. Napoleon's aspiration to be seen as more than a conqueror was met with scepticism and resistance. The campaign, while achieving some military successes, ultimately faltered. The logistical nightmare of sustaining an army in a foreign land, the failure to significantly undermine British power, and the mounting resistance from the local population and Ottoman forces signalled the limits of Napoleon's ambition. In 1799... Amidst growing challenges, Napoleon made a fateful decision to abandon his army in Egypt and return to France, a move that was both an admission of the campaign's untenability and a strategic retreat to salvage his rising political career. The Egyptian campaign was a chapter in Napoleon's life that epitomized his brilliance, ambition, and the hubris that often accompanied his endeavors. It was a campaign that transcended mere military objectives, leaving a lasting impact on both Egypt and France. The blend of military conquest with scientific and cultural exploration was unprecedented, marking the campaign as a unique endeavor in the annals of military history. The legacy of the Egyptian campaign is a complex tapestry of triumph, tragedy, and enduring fascination, a testament to the enigmatic figure of Napoleon Bonaparte and his timeless quest for glory. In the grand narrative of Napoleon Bonaparte's life, his military and political achievements are often the most lauded. Yet an equally compelling aspect of his story is his prowess in the art of seduction. We will delve into the intricate web of Napoleon's romantic entanglements, revealing a man whose conquests were not confined to the battlefield, but extended into the hearts and lives of many women. These liaisons were not mere romantic escapades. They were intertwined with his ambitions, playing a crucial role in his ascent to power and his conduct as a ruler. Napoleon's charm, charisma, and power made him an irresistible figure to many women of his era. His relationships were varied and complex, ranging from passionate love affairs to strategic alliances. These women were not just passive recipients of his affections, but played significant roles in the tapestry of his life, influencing his decisions and shaping his legacy. The most notable of Napoleon's love affairs was, of course, with Josephine de Beauharnais, his first wife. However, their marriage was fraught with drama, marked by infidelities and the strain of political life. Beyond Josephine, there were other significant women in Napoleon's life. One such figure was Marie Walowska, a Polish noblewoman. Their affair began during Napoleon's campaign in Poland and was marked by a mix of romantic passion and political calculation. Marie was seen as a means to secure Polish loyalty to his regime, yet their relationship evolved into a deep and genuine connection, resulting in the birth of a son. Another notable liaison was with Countess Marie-Louise of Austria, his second wife and the mother of his heir. This marriage arranged to secure an alliance with Austria, was initially a relationship of convenience. However, it grew into a partnership marked by mutual respect and affection, producing the long-desired heir, Napoleon II. These relationships were not isolated episodes. They were part of a broader pattern where Napoleon's personal life intersected with his political ambitions. His affairs were often strategic, aimed at strengthening alliances or securing his position. However, they also revealed a man who sought love and companionship, a contrast to his public persona as a stoic and unyielding ruler. Napoleon's approach to these relationships was a reflection of his complex character— he could be intensely passionate and remarkably tender in his correspondences, yet he was also capable of cold pragmatism, sacrificing personal relationships for political gain. His letters to his lovers, especially to Josephine, are testament to the depth of his emotional engagement.
They are filled with expressions of longing, jealousy, and sometimes despair, painting a picture of a man deeply affected by the vicissitudes of love. However, Napoleon's relationships also had a darker side. His infidelities and the way he manoeuvred the women in his life for political advantage speak to a certain opportunism and a willingness to use personal relationships as tools in his grand strategy. This duality of deep affection and calculated manipulation is a recurring theme in his romantic life, reflecting the complexities of his character. In the broader context of his life, these romantic entanglements were more than just personal indulgences. They were integral to his narrative. They humanized a figure often seen as a ruthless conqueror and revealed the personal costs of his relentless pursuit of power. His relationships provided a window into the pride world of a public figure, offering insights into his motivations, vulnerabilities and the contradictions that defined him. The art of seduction in Napoleon's life was a multifaceted affair. It was a dance of love, power, and politics where personal and political motivations were deeply intertwined. The women in his life were not mere footnotes. They were influential figures who impacted his decisions and the course of history. The story of Napoleon's romantic endeavors is a captivating exploration of the interplay between power, love, and ambition, adding a rich and personal dimension to the legend of this historical titan. The path to the throne for Napoleon Bonaparte was as dramatic and intricate as any of his military campaigns. Let's discuss his meteoric rise from a military general to the Emperor of France, a journey marked by ambition, cunning, and a relentless drive for power. In this narrative, we witness the transformation of a Corsican outsider into a ruler who would reshape Europe. Napoleon's ascent began in the tumultuous aftermath of the French Revolution, a period marked by political chaos and societal upheaval. The revolution had dismantled the old monarchy, creating a vacuum that a figure like Napoleon, with his ambition and military prowess, could exploit. His first significant step towards power came in 1795, when he was called to suppress a royalist insurrection threatening the National Convention in Paris. With a whiff of grape shot, Napoleon swiftly and ruthlessly quelled the uprising, saving the revolutionary government and earning himself fame and political capital. Following this, Napoleon's military successes in Italy and Egypt further bolstered his reputation. In Italy, he defeated the Austrians with a combination of brilliant tactics and sheer audacity, transforming the French army from a demoralized force into an invincible machine. The Egyptian campaign, despite its ultimate failure, added to his mystique, portraying him as a conqueror and a patron of science. These triumphs were not just military victories. They were carefully crafted narratives that elevated Napoleon's status as a national hero. The political landscape of France at the time was ripe for a figure like Napoleon. The directory, the government that had emerged from the revolution, was ineffectual and corrupt, unable to bring stability or inspire public confidence. The people of France, weary of years of revolution and war, longed for a leader who could restore order and grandeur to France. Napoleon seized this opportunity in November 1799. In a masterstroke of political manoeuvring, he overthrew the directory and replaced it with the consulate, with himself as the first consul. This move was a delicate balancing act, maintaining the appearance of republican ideals while laying the foundation for absolute power. The coup was presented not as a seizure of power, but as a necessary intervention to save the republic and restore stability. As first consul, Napoleon embarked on a series of reforms that transformed France. He stabilized the economy, established the Bank of France, reformed the legal system with the introduction of the Napoleonic Code, and restructured the education system. These reforms were not just about consolidation of power. They were genuine attempts to rebuild a nation torn by revolution and war. They earned him both respect and loyalty, further solidifying his grip on power. Napoleon's rule was also marked by a careful cultivation of his image. 
He was acutely aware of the importance of public perception and utilized art, propaganda, and ceremony to project an image of authority and invincibility. His coronation as Emperor of the French in 1804 was a grand spectacle, a carefully choreographed event that symbolized the dawn of a new era. In a bold move, he crowned himself, signaling his belief that his authority came not from the church or the people, but from his own achievements and destiny. The transition from first consul to emperor was a gradual erosion of the republican ideals of the revolution. Yet it was met with surprisingly little resistance. This acceptance was partly due to Napoleon's popularity and the belief that his rule could bring stability and glory to France. However, it was also a testament to his skill in navigating the political landscape, manipulating public opinion and neutralizing his opponents. Napoleon's rise to power was a complex interplay of military success political acumen, and an unyielding ambition. He emerged as a figure who could not only wield military power, but also understand and manipulate the intricacies of political power. His ascent to the throne was not just the story of an individual's quest for power. It was a reflection of the times, a period where the old order was crumbling and a new order was being forged. The lure of the throne for Napoleon was both a personal ambition and a historical inevitability. His rise from a general to an emperor was a journey that reshaped not just his life, but the entire course of European history. It was a testament to his extraordinary capabilities and a reflection of a society in flux, searching for a new identity in the aftermath of revolution and chaos. Napoleon Bonaparte's ascent to power was not solely a quest for personal glory. It was also driven by a desire to establish a lasting dynasty that would secure his legacy. Napoleon's wanted to create a new imperial lineage, a dream that was as ambitious as it was emblematic of his vision for France and Europe. It is a story of political alliances, personal sacrifices, and the relentless pursuit of a legacy that would endure beyond the battlefield. The concept of dynasty was central to Napoleon's vision of empire. Having risen to power in a society that had violently overthrown its monarchy, he understood that his rule needed legitimacy and continuity to survive. The creation of a dynasty was not just about personal ambition. It was about establishing a stable and enduring regime that would solidify the gains of the revolution while ending the chaos and instability that had plagued France. Napoleon's first marriage to Josephine de Beauharnais had been a union of love and political convenience. However, the inability of Josephine to bear him an heir became a matter of state concern. An heir was essential for the establishment of a dynasty, and without one, Napoleon's empire would be vulnerable to collapse upon his death. The decision to divorce Josephine, painful and personal, was a testament to his commitment to this larger vision. In 1810, Napoleon married Marie-Louise, the Archduchess of Austria. This alliance was a masterstroke of political maneuvering as it brought together two of the most powerful families in Europe. The Habsburgs were one of the oldest and most prestigious royal families, and their alliance with the Bonapartes was a significant legitimization of Napoleon's rule. Marie-Louise, a young and somewhat naive archduchess, was thrust into the center of European politics. A marriage to Napoleon was not just a personal union. It was a diplomatic bond that reshaped the geopolitical landscape. The birth of their son... Napoleon François Joseph Charles Bonaparte, known as the King of Rome, was a moment of triumph for Napoleon. The heir, born in 1811, was more than a son. He was the embodiment of Napoleon's dreams for a lasting empire. He represented the fusion of old European royalty with the new Napoleonic order, a symbol of the potential for a lasting peace and stability in Europe. Napoleon took immense pride in his son, lavishing attention and dreaming of the future he would inherit. The King of Rome was not just a child. He was the cornerstone of a new dynasty, a living symbol of the continuity and legitimacy of the Napoleonic Empire. Napoleon's plans for his son were grandiose. 
He envisioned him as a ruler who would continue the work he had begun, consolidating the French Empire and maintaining its preeminence in Europe. However, the dream of a dynasty was not without its challenges. The creation of a new imperial lineage provoked resistance and anxiety among the traditional monarchies of Europe. Napoleon's empire, built on the ideals of the revolution and sustained by military might, was seen as a threat to the established order. The marriage to Marie-Louise and the birth of an heir, while legitimizing his rule, also intensified the coalitions against him. The dynastic ambitions of Napoleon also intersected with his military campaigns. The wars he waged across Europe were not just about territorial expansion. They were about securing a future for his empire and his dynasty. Each victory and each defeat had implications not just for his immediate power, but for the long-term survival of the dynasty he hoped to establish. In the end, the dream of a dynasty would remain unfulfilled. The collapse of Napoleon's empire, following his disastrous Russian campaign and the eventual defeat at Waterloo, dashed the hopes of establishing a lasting lineage. Napoleon's abdication and exile, followed by his death in 1821, marked the end of his imperial ambitions. His son, the King of Rome, would never rule France, and the Napoleonic dynasty would fade into history. The story of Napoleon's dream of a dynasty is a poignant chapter in his life. It was a dream driven by a desire for legitimacy, stability, and continuity. It was a reflection of his understanding of the importance of legacy and the role of lineage in the political landscape of Europe. The attempt to establish a Bonaparte dynasty was an ambitious endeavor, a blend of personal desire and political strategy. It is a testament to Napoleon's vision and ambition, and a reminder of the fragility of power and the impermanence of empires. In the grand narrative of Napoleon Bonaparte's reign, the continental system stands as a testament to his ambition to dominate not just through military might, but through economic warfare. Initiated in 1806, this bold and far-reaching blockade was intended to cripple Britain, Napoleon's most enduring adversary by cutting off its trade with Europe. Now we turn to his economic strategy, exploring its motivations, execution, and the far-reaching consequences it had on Europe and on Napoleon's own empire. The origins of the continental system can be traced back to Napoleon's realization that traditional military tactics alone could not subdue Britain, an island nation with a formidable navy. Britain's strength lay in its vast overseas trade, which funded its military campaigns against France. Napoleon, in a stroke of strategic ingenuity, decided to attack Britain's economic lifeline, aiming to bring the nation to its knees by isolating it from the lucrative European markets. The Berlin Decree of 1806 marked the beginning of the continental system. It proclaimed a blockade against British trade, forbidding French allies and conquests from trading with Britain. The decree was followed by a series of additional measures and countermeasures, as Britain responded with its own blockade of France. Europe was soon engulfed in an economic war of unprecedented scale, a war that extended beyond the battlefields to the ports, marketplaces, and homes of ordinary people. The implementation of the continental system was a monumental undertaking. It required the cooperation, willing or coerced, of every nation under French influence, from the Iberian Peninsula to the vast expanse of Russia. Napoleon's empire, at its zenith, stretched across most of continental Europe, and he leveraged this dominance to enforce the blockade. The system was more than a mere embargo. It was an attempt to reorient the entire economic landscape of Europe to redraw the lines of trade and power in favour of France. However, the continental system was fraught with challenges and contradictions. The blockade was leaky and unevenly enforced, with smuggling and corruption rampant. Countries under French control, including allies such as the Netherlands and client states like the Kingdom of Italy, suffered under the economic strain. Their economies, heavily reliant on trade, were choked by the inability to access British goods and markets. The impact of the continental system was profound and far-reaching. 
It disrupted the traditional trade routes and economic structures of Europe, leading to shortages, inflation, and economic dislocation. Industries in France and across the continent struggled to adapt to the new economic realities, with some regions experiencing severe hardship. The system also had unintended political consequences, stoking resentment and anger against French rule, especially in regions like Spain and Russia. For Britain, the continental system was a challenge, but not a fatal blow. The British economy adapted by seeking alternative markets and sources for goods. Moreover, Britain's naval dominance allowed it to enforce its own blockade against France, exacerbating the economic woes on the continent. The system, intended to weaken Britain, ultimately had the paradoxical effect of strengthening its resolve and capacity to resist Napoleon. The most dramatic consequence of the continental system was its role in triggering the Peninsular War in Spain and the catastrophic invasion of Russia in 1812. In Spain, the enforcement of the blockade led to widespread unrest and a brutal war of attrition, draining French resources and attention. In Russia, Tsar Alexander's refusal to comply with the blockade led to Napoleon's ill-fated invasion, a campaign that would mark the beginning of the end of his empire. The continental system was a bold experiment in economic warfare, a reflection of Napoleon's ambition to reshape the European order. It was a strategy that sought to leverage France's continental dominance to challenge the naval supremacy of Britain. However, it was also a policy that carried high risks and unintended consequences. The system strained the economies of Europe, including France, and contributed to the growing discontent and resistance against Napoleon's rule. The continental system, with its grand ambitions and flawed execution, stands as a symbol of the limits of Napoleonic power and the complexity of economic warfare. In the annals of military history, few campaigns resonate with the echo of hubris and tragedy as profoundly as Napoleon Bonaparte's 1812 Russian campaign. This audacious gamble, driven by ambition and imperial overreach, marked a turning point in Napoleon's fortune. Let's explore the fateful decision to invade Russia, the harrowing experiences of the Grand Army, and the catastrophic consequences of this ill-fated campaign. The decision to invade Russia stemmed from a complex web of geopolitical strategies and personal ambitions. Napoleon, at the height of his power, sought to enforce the continental system, his economic blockade against Britain by compelling Tsar Alexander I of Russia into compliance, the Tsar's refusal to adhere to the blockade and his ongoing trade with Britain, were seen as direct affronts to Napoleon's authority. Furthermore, the Russian campaign was intended to solidify Napoleon's dominance over Europe and secure his legacy as an unrivaled military genius. In June 1812, Napoleon's Grand Army, one of the largest ever assembled, crossed the Niemen River into Russian territory. This army, comprising over 600,000 men from various nations under French control, was a testament to Napoleon's ability to mobilize and command a vast multinational force. The invasion began with the optimism and grandeur characteristic of Napoleon's earlier campaigns, but it would soon devolve into a nightmare of epic proportions. The Russian strategy, masterminded by General Mikhail Kutuzov, was to avoid direct confrontation with Napoleon's forces, steadily retreating deeper into Russian territory. This tactic, coupled with scorched-earth policies, denied the French army essential supplies and stretched their supply lines dangerously thin. The vastness of the Russian landscape, the harsh terrain and the onset of the Russian summer took a severe toll on the French troops, unaccustomed to such conditions. As the campaign dragged on, the initial victories, such as the capture of Smolensk, proved pyrrhic. The Russian army, although retreating, remained largely intact, hiding its time for the right moment to strike. The pivotal moment came at the Battle of Borodino in September 1812. This brutal and bloody engagement, one of the deadliest of the Napoleonic Wars, resulted in heavy casualties on both sides, but failed to deliver a decisive victory for Napoleon. 
The occupation of Moscow, the objective of the campaign, was the next strategic goal. However, upon entering the city, the French army found it largely deserted and soon engulfed in flames. The burning of Moscow, whether a deliberate act of Russian defiance or an accident, was a psychological blow to Napoleon and his army. The expected capitulation of Russia did not materialize, and the Grand Army found itself in a devastated city, without supplies or shelter, as the brutal Russian winter began to set in. The retreat from Moscow, which began in October 1812, was a harrowing ordeal for the Grand Army, harassed by Russian forces, plagued by starvation, disease, and the merciless cold. The army disintegrated. The retreat turned into a desperate flight for survival. The crossing of the Berezina River, under relentless Russian attack, was a scene of utter desperation and chaos, symbolizing the complete collapse of Napoleon's campaign. The Russian campaign's toll was staggering. The Grand Army was decimated, with only a fraction of its original strength surviving the ordeal. The loss of men, horses, and materiel was unparalleled. The campaign exposed the limits of Napoleon's military genius and the vulnerabilities of his empire. It shattered the aura of invincibility that had surrounded him and emboldened his adversaries. The Russian campaign was a monumental gamble that ended in catastrophe for Napoleon. It was a miscalculation driven by overconfidence and a misunderstanding of the complexities of waging war in the vast, unforgiving landscape of Russia. The campaign marked the beginning of the decline of Napoleon's empire, a turning point from which he would never fully recover. The Russian gamble stands as a powerful testament to the perils of imperial overreach and the unpredictable nature of war, echoing through history as a cautionary tale of ambition and hubris. The story of Napoleon Bonaparte, a tale of meteoric rise and dramatic fall, reaches its denouement in this final segment. Following the catastrophic Russian campaign, Napoleon faced a relentless coalition of enemies, leading to his ultimate defeat and exile. This chapter of his life is a poignant reflection on the fragility of power and the inexorable tides of history. After the Russian debacle, Napoleon returned to France to rebuild his army, but the landscape of European politics had irrevocably changed. The disaster in Russia had shattered the myth of his invincibility, emboldening his adversary. A new coalition comprising Britain, Russia, Prussia, Austria, and others formed against him, determined to end his dominion over Europe. In 1813, the war resumed with renewed vigor. The Battle of Leipzig, also known as the Battle of Nations, was a crucial confrontation. It was the largest battle in Europe prior to World War I, involving armies from multiple nations determined to bring down the French Emperor. Despite his tactical brilliance, Napoleon was outnumbered and outmaneuvered. The defeat at Leipzig was a crippling blow, leading to the retreat of French forces and the invasion of France by the coalition. Despite these setbacks, Napoleon's resolve did not waver. He fought a series of defensive battles in France, displaying his military genius even in the face of overwhelming odds. But the relentless pressure from the coalition forces and the internal weakening of his regime made his position untenable. Paris held to the coalition forces in March 1814, and Napoleon, faced with the inevitable, abdicated the throne in April. Napoleon's first exile was to the Mediterranean island of Elba, a decision by the coalition powers that reflected a mix of respect and pragmatism. They allowed him sovereignty over the small island, a token acknowledgement of his former status. In Elba, Napoleon, ever the statesman and soldier, busied himself with administrative reforms and military drills, a shadow ruler in a miniature kingdom. However, the story of Napoleon was not yet finished. In a dramatic turn of events, in February 1815, he escaped from Elba and returned to France. This period, known as the Hundred Days, saw a remarkable resurgence of his power. He was welcomed by the army and reclaimed the throne almost without opposition, a testament to his enduring charisma and the loyalty he commanded. But this return was short-lived. 
The coalition powers, alarmed at his resurgence, prepared for a final showdown. The Battle of Waterloo, fought on June 18, 1815, in Belgium, was the last battle of the Napoleonic Wars. It pitted Napoleon against a British-led coalition under the Duke of Wellington and a Prussian army led by Gebhard Leberecht von Bluter. The battle, marked by strategic blunders and the tenacity of the coalition forces, ended in a crushing defeat for Napoleon. Waterloo was the final blow that ended Napoleon's rule and his dreams of empire. He abdicated for the second time and surrendered to the British, hoping for leniency. However, the coalition powers, determined to prevent any possibility of his return, exiled him to St. Helena, a remote island in the South Atlantic. It was a harsh and lonely exile, far from the power and glory he had once known. In St. Helena, Napoleon lived his final years under strict British supervision, his health gradually deteriorating. He spent his time reflecting on his life and legacy, dictating his memoirs and engaging in intellectual pursuits. His death on May 5th, 1821, was an anticlimactic end to a life that had once shaken the world. The fall and exile of Napoleon Bonaparte are as dramatic and significant as his rise to power. His downfall was a complex interplay of military defeat, political miscalculation, and the shifting allegiances of the time. His exile to St. Helena symbolizes the isolation and ultimate fragility of power. Napoleon's legacy, however, endures in the Napoleonic Code the reshaping of European borders and the ideological impact of his rule. His story, from Corsica to St. Helena, is a testament to the extraordinary capabilities and limitations of one individual in shaping the course of history. As our journey through the life of Napoleon Bonaparte comes to a close, we are left to ponder the multifaceted legacy of a man who, for better or worse, reshaped the world in his image. The conclusion of this tale is not just the end of a singular, extraordinary life, but the culmination of an era that forever altered the course of human history. Napoleon's legacy is a complex tapestry woven with threads of military genius, administrative brilliance, unbridled ambition, and a profound impact on the political and social fabric of Europe. He emerged during a time of tumultuous change in the wake of the French Revolution and seized the opportunities presented by a continent in flux. His rise to power was meteoric, marked by an unparalleled series of military victories that expanded French influence across Europe. However, Napoleon was more than a military conqueror. He was a reformer whose policies and ideas left a lasting imprint. The Napoleonic Code, one of his most enduring legacies, rationalized legal systems across Europe, laying the foundation for modern law. It embodied the Enlightenment principles of equality before the law, secular governance, and the rationalization of administrative processes. These reforms extended beyond France, influencing legal systems in many parts of Europe and beyond. Napoleon's impact on the political landscape of Europe was equally profound. He redrew the map of Europe, abolishing the Holy Roman Empire, creating new states, and altering the balance of power. His reign marked the transition from feudal monarchies to more centralized bureaucratic states. The spread of Napoleonic ideals also contributed to the rise of nationalism, a force that would shape the 19th and 20th centuries. Yet Napoleon's legacy is also marked by the devastation wrought by his wars. His military campaigns led to immense suffering and loss of life. The quest for glory and power resulted in the deaths of millions and left many regions of Europe in ruin. The scale and frequency of his wars brought a level of total warfare that Europe had not seen before, setting a precedent for future conflicts. In cultural terms, Napoleon's influence extended to art, architecture, and literature. He patronized the arts, collecting and commissioning works that glorified his regime. The architectural transformations in Paris and other cities under his rule left lasting marks of his neoclassical aesthetic. His life and times became a source of inspiration for writers, artists, and composers, both during his reign and in the centuries that followed.
The story of Napoleon's fall and exile is as dramatic as his rise. His final defeat at Waterloo and subsequent exile to St. Helena transformed him from a figure of power to one of reflection and legend. In his isolation, he became the subject of myth, a once great emperor reduced to a brooding, introspective figure contemplating his achievements and failures. His death in 1821 did not diminish his stature, but rather cemented his place in history as a subject of endless fascination and debate. Napoleon's life raises enduring questions about the nature of power, leadership, and legacy. He was a product of his times, yet he also shaped those times in ways that few individuals have. His story is a reflection on the possibilities and limits of human ambition, the complexities of heroism and tyranny, and the indelible impact of individual will on the course of history. In the end, Napoleon Bonaparte remains an enigmatic figure, a personification of the contradictions of his era. He was a champion of the Enlightenment ideals and an architect of empire, a liberator and a conqueror. He was also a visionary and a despot. His legacy continues to provoke admiration, debate and censure, a testament to his profound and lasting impact on the world. As we conclude this exploration of Napoleon's life, we are reminded that history is not just the chronicle of events, but the story of individuals who, through their actions and ideas, shape the destiny of nations. Napoleon's journey from Corsican obscurity to European dominance and eventual exile is a story of human potential, ambition, and the inexorable march of history. It is a narrative that continues to resonate, offering insights into the complexities of power, the allure of greatness, and the enduring fascination with one of history's most compelling figures. Thank you for joining us on this enchanting journey through medieval history. While our weekly episodes will continue to captivate your imagination, there's an exclusive treasure trove for subscribers. A secret vault of bonus episodes filled with extra tales and deep dives into the subjects we cover. Your curiosity fuels our mission, and we're truly thankful for your support. Until we meet again among stone walls and towering turrets, keep that torch of curiosity burning bright. Thank you for listening.